Today we'll be speaking about the horror text within the Old Testament, specifically the story of the unnamed concubine and the Levites. And I will begin with a quick review of Tribble's article on this scripture passage. And it begins with an excuse. And she records that in those days no king was in Israel and every man did what was right in his eyes. And this is a general call to the chaos and anarchy which reigned in those days before there was a monarchy. This whole scripture passage is commonly seen as a call for the monarchy, for the rule of man over his fellows. However, Tribble goes on to give a, an alternative interpretation of this passage, and she begins with an invitation to the people involved. And so we're introduced to a Levite and a concubine, who are the main characters of the story. The Levite is from a tribe which is generally held in high regard by the other 11 tribes, and the Levites hold a place of an honor and respect in normal society within the Hebrew people. The concubine, unfortunately, is not only lesser to the man because she's female, but also lesser to other females because she's a concubine and not a wife. Now again, this is the societal norms for the people at the time, and not necessarily anything that we should be believing today in this day and age. The scriptures go on and there are some discrepancies between the Hebrew scriptures and the Greek interpretations. The Hebrew scriptures read that the concubine played the harlot and that she was unfaithful to the Levites, whatever the relationship might have been. And the Greek scriptures state that the concubine grew angry with the Levites. Regardless of which interpretation you follow, the woman then goes on to show her only act of self-determination in the whole story, and she runs away from the Levite to return to the safety of her father's house. And this brings us to what is part one of her downfall. The Levite chases after the concubine, eventually, after realizing that she is not coming back, the Bible says it is just about four months after she leaves that he finally gets up to follow after her. He initially starts off with the goal of winning her back with affection. The Bible says that he plans to speak to her heart. But this is a goal which is never actually attempted or actualized within the passages that follow. The Levite meets with the father eventually and all plans to speak with the concubine are lost at this point. Instead, they're replaced with a story of male bonding as the two make merry. Eventually, after many attempts to leave, the father allows the party to begin their journey home. The father, in this case, instead of showing paternal care or protectiveness for his daughter, sends her out instead with the Levites. No arguments heard by the father from the daughter, no cries made, and the woman continues to have no voice in the matter. It continues that the men all get what they want, and the women get nothing that they want. The father gets to show how great he is in his hospitality and his generosity by giving away his daughter, and the Levite gets a concubine back. The concubine gets to go back with the Levite where she ran away from in the first place. Part two of our story continues in the city of Gabeah, and this is sometime after the party has left the father's house, and they found themselves in the questionable safety of Gabeah, and unfortunately, nobody seems to want to let them in their house for the nights. They have no place to stay, and darkness is approaching. An old man comes to them at the well, and the Levite then goes on to flatter him and do everything he can to convince the old man to let him stay at his house. He even goes so far as to offer the concubine to hit the old man, saying, she is your handmaid. And eventually the old man does offer his hospitality, possibly reluctantly or possibly just after he has seen all the arguments which the Levite brings up. And so they follow him to his house. During the night, the Levite and the old man make merry, they eat and drink, and the concubine is once again unseen, unheard, and someplace in the background. Partway through the night, a group of men calls on the man, pounding on the door, saying that they want the Levite to be sent out. They want to know him, which is the biblical slang for they would like to have sexual relations. The old man begins to negotiate with the man. He first attempts to just have them go away, saying that this is an evil thought and an evil action which you want to do. 
And when that fails, the man goes on to offer his virgin daughter and the concubine which the Levi brought with him. The old man's sense of hospitality is what's causing him to value the integrity of a male stranger more highly than that of his own daughter. His own daughter, who is innocent, being described in the Bible as still being a virgin. And to say nothing of the concubine, who is far less in any kind of value to the old man. The old man's sense of hospitality only covers the rights of the man, the Levite, who's visiting. The old man respects that the Levite is protected by law to not be sexually abused by the men, that that is immoral. But he has no qualms about sending his own daughter out to face that same fate. However, before the men can respond to the old man's offer of two women, the Levite cowardly pushes the concubine out into the streets and tells the men to do with her as they will, and they respond with doing such to her as they would. And after a long session of terror, the woman is allowed to go free. It's only when the sun rises that she is allowed to go back to the Levite and the old man's house. She does make her way back there, but falls to the ground almost to the safety of the house, her fingertips on the doorsteps. In the morning, the Levite's about to make his escape from this evil town and hasn't even given a thought to the concubine. Without searching for her or inquiring as to where she is, he packs his belongings and prepares to leave, and only when he encounters on her on the doorstep does he stop and pay attention to her. And this is only to tell her to get up and that they are going. Quite obviously, the concubine does not respond. And again, we have another discrepancy between the scriptures. And in the Greek scripture, it is reported that she is already dead, passed away from her suffering. The Greek Hebrew scriptures, on the other hand, the her survival is not defined. And it's up to the interpretation of the reader as to what her state is at this point. We now continue on with the Levite's call to justice portion of the story. And so the Levite returns home with the body of the concubine strapped to one of the donkeys. And it's clear that either he doesn't care to aid her and bring her back to good health if she's still alive, or to mourn her if she's already dead, he simply packs her onto the back of the donkey like a sack of flour and heads home. Now, depending on the interpretation of the scriptures you are following, the concubine has either survived or not, but at this point the Levite cuts her up into pieces and sends them off to the tribes of Israel and uses that as a call to bring the people in to bring justice and to demand that from the men in Gabeah. At this point the woman is re reduced to a mere token and is used as a warning or threat to others in her broken states, much the same way that the ox was when Saul chopped the ox and sent it as a warning to the tribes later on in the Bible. The tribes of Israel do come, and when the Benjaminites fail to give up the men, they proceed to do battle with them. After the murder of one woman, tens of thousands are killed in battle in retribution for one woman's death. And all the women and children of the Benjaminites are killed, and all the men are killed except the 600 who are allowed to escape, and this is only when the tribes of Israel realize that they are on the brink of destroying one of the 12 tribes. There's nothing said about the deaths of the tens of thousands of people, but we can't have one tribe go missing. We have to save it. And so, in response to the crime of rape and murder, the tribes show their justice by killing people by the scores. And in their remorse, they go out and they kill more people. They go to the town of Jabesh Gilead, which did not join into the battle. And when they get there, they kill all the men, all the women, and all the children, except for the 400 virgin girls that they find there. And they take these virgin girls captive and hand them over to the surviving Benjaminites. And when the Benjaminites see this, they say to the rest of the Israelite tribes, that this isn't enough, there's only 400 of them, and we have 600 men. And so the Benjaminites are given a deal, they're told how to capture another 200 women. This time they are even more innocent than those of the 400. 
they are chosen from the festival of Shiloh where the virgins come to dance in the celebration and in response to the outcry that might have come the Benjaminites are told to ask the fathers and brothers and sons and people involved in the families to be quiet and just let it happen and this seems to be what actually occurs no outcry is heard and no further call for justice when the Benjaminites take another 200 women captive. So in total, in their call for justice against the rape and murder of one woman, tens of thousands of men are killed and women are killed and children are killed and another 600 young girls are taken captive and given to the Benjaminites to be raped and to bear children forcibly by those men. So I'd like to continue this by examining how some other commentaries are viewing this passage. We've already seen a quick look at how Tribble interprets the writings, and so I will go on to look at what the Women's Bible Commentary has to say on this passage. Now the authors of the Women's Bible Commentary note many of the same points as Tribble does, and also tellingly they begin their section on this with describing how this story is typically treated as an appendix by most other commentators. I decided to have a look into this statement and I looked into the Holman Bible Commentary which indeed follows suit with their description and they provided mere six short paragraphs describing the story and then a further three paragraphs describing the theological and ethical values portrayed within. It says nothing directly to the story of the concubine in its summary and is very short and non-committal on its comments regarding them when it does mention them at all. Uh, next, I looked at the pulpit commentary, which on the other hand has a great deal to say about the story. However, instead of painting the Levite in the way that Tribble and the Women's Bible Commentary does, they describe the Levite in the most generous manner and they spend a great deal of time describing the depravity of men and that being the cause of the ultimate and great sins which come at the conclusion of the story. And it all but ignores the concubine in its description of what's going on in this passage. After the battle of the Benjamites is covered in great detail, at the end, 600 women given to survivors is completely ignored, and one must dig deep into the subtle words to find any allusion to these innocent women given to the survivors, as trophies of war. So going back to the women's Bible commentary, they bring up the idea of the attempted rape of the Levite as an example of the homophobic and xenophobic natures of the people of the town of Gibeah. The men of the gang aren't necessarily homosexual in themselves, but rather they're preying on the homophobic nature of men in society in general, and that of the Levite in particular and they are preying on the fears of being penetrated like a woman, which to the men of the biblical time is the most defining act that they can have inflicted upon them. And so the actions of this gang aren't so much to give out their sexual frustrations on the man, but to degrade him and to defile him in the most demeaning way as possible. In the end, they carry out their defilement through the proxy of the concubine. In his absence, the Levite is given the same defilement as he would if he went out in some way. In response to the sacrifice of the 600 women in the battle, they also note that there's a lack of voice from these females, and they're just like the concubine, they're silent and have no voice no outcry and no complaints as to either the original 400 nor of the 200 women that come afterwards. The horrific and graphic imagery used is instead described as a warning to the people of what will happen if there's no king, if there's no man, in ultimate power over the people. The story shows that there is a societal treatment of women and of outsiders in times of peace which is degrading and demeaning and there is not only an acceptance at the time of war of the mistreatment of women which is increased over times of peace not only allowed and accepted but in some ways it is describing as the expected outcome of battle that the women are expected to be the trophies 
and the booty from the successful campaign of war. And in contrast to the Women's Bible Contrary, I have looked at to the Lang's Bible Commentary. And this commentary would appear to be written from the support of the androcentric portion of humanity and is written in support of the Levite and not in damning him. Lang's commentary argues from the beginning that the Levite is not quite so bad as the Women's Bible and Tribble makes him out to be and that the concubine is not really his wife for any reason of choice by the Levite to denigrate her, but also that he might be married and that the concubine is the only accepted way for him to have a relationship because he already has a wife. And the woman is portrayed in the light of playing the harlot's interpretation of this Hebrew text and it forces the fault of what follows upon her instead of upon the Levites. There is some emphasis placed upon the Levites carnal and selfish nature when he continues to stay at the father's house and it shows him indulging in the lavish offerings of drinking food and good times and this selfish nature will come to play later on when the Levite pushes the concubine out to face the men in the streets. There's a most revealing package as to the viewpoint of the Levite provided in his commentary, and it reads as thus. It must have been a fearful night for the Levites, knowing that his concubine was in the power of the wanton mob, and it was a terrible morning when he found her dead on the threshold of the house. Within the writings of his commentary, the Levite is showing us fearing for his concubine and a terrible shock at seeing her dead on the doorstep neither which viewpoint is actually apparent in the scripture and rather the opposite would seem to be the general outcome of reading. The male-centric interpretation is quite visible in this passage and continues on throughout the most of the commentary. Following the story of the concubine's death and dismemberments, there is a great deal of time spent on justifying the battle which follows, which allows for the killing of almost the entire tribe of Benjaminites but the next section which deals with the 600 women is quite unusual. It starts off with the 400 women and acknowledges that they were given to the Benjaminites but only in enough time to say that there wasn't enough women to satisfy their needs. Exactly one solitary sentence is dedicated to these 400 women captured from the town that was sacked. After this there's a great deal of effort spent on the next 200 women which were taken by the survivors from the totally innocent ladies who attended the festival at Shiloh and they were described as using a loophole in the law and sending a request to the fathers and brothers and sons of these women and families to not interfere and this results in a seeming shrugging of the shoulders of the men as there's no outcry or feedback or anything to say that they did anything but get on with life. And so we need to have spent some time in response to this story and the statements of these commentaries. And the first question that would come up is, does this story actually imply that women need to be denigrated or beneath men? that the society at the time of Bible scripture being written require women to be beneath the males. Tribble points to two other stories in her article which are also written from the time of Judges before the kings took their rule. The first of which is the story of Hannah who receives sympathetic attention in her story. In her story his worth is highlighted by the men in her society and her culture. The next story that she mentions is that of Naomi and Ruth, who are blessed by God and able to make their own way in life after the death of Naomi's husband and her and Ruth return to her hometown. Ruth receives a great deal of hospitality from men. In fact, her future husband tells his servants not to bother her, but to not only let her pick the grain off the ground, but to leave a little bit of extra for her. He deals with her very kindly and in the end marries her and makes sure that she is safe and sound and that her mother is as well. 
These stories attempt to reinterpret the language of a man's world to preserve the integrity and dignity of women in the story. Tribble has a call to the reader at the end of her article, and she warns that the calling is dangerous and that to speak for the concubine is to speak against the scriptures because the authors and the editors have already denied her humanity. They've denied her a living presence in the scriptures and defiled her into a position of being a mere possession. And to think anywhere otherwise argues against that which is written. There's also a recognition in the story that these are not limited to biblical times, but are things that are ongoing in every age, even in this age. Women are still treated as objects and in a manner similar to the concubine, and the outcomes for these individuals haven't really changed since the times of the Old Testament. Even in Canada, where we are the most upstanding and valuing of freedom and rights of humanity of any people in the world, one might argue, we constantly see women and children and ladies in positions of defilement, in positions of inferiority, and being pushed down in society. We constantly hear stories of our Indigenous women who are being murdered and missing, and there is no outcry in the general population to bring any justice to these women. So even in today, we can still see stories which very closely match those of what's in the scripture. And so we need to remind ourselves that there's a call to say never again. And just like the Levite in his selfish call to justice, to observe, to think, and to speak about it. Even if he only did that in the selfish efforts to gain justice and to push himself up in the world, his statements are valuable to us even today. I'd like to close this talk with a quick introspection of the amount of detail and time spent on this story. We can assume, as most of the Bibles in the Old Testament and the New Testament were attributed to being written by men, that these scriptures are also written by a man in the time of the Old Testament. And the question or concern that comes up is the amount of time in contrast to other things in the Bible, which are also evil and to be countered against. I would bring up the description of many of the reigns of the kings in the Old Testament. Many kings described as evil are given a mere paragraph, and their reign is concluded with a single statement of, and they did evil in the eyes of the Lord. You could fit literally many of these generations of stories within the single story of one unnamed concubine. And so what does it say about what's going on here? The amount of time spent in this story obviously is normally attributed to being a call for justice and more importantly a call for the dominion of a man, a king, over the people. But we could just as easily see that same argument if we, like the kings, summarize the story of the concubine into a short one-liner and in that case it might read the evil men of the tribe of Benjamin did evil unto the concubine of the Levites and the tribes of Israel rose in anger righteously devouring those of the Benjamite tribe and so we would have the same argument the same end result and very little would be lost from the meaning and the reason for the war and for the call of a king However, the amount of detail does potentially say something about a call for justice and a call for equality. Looking again at the stories of Hannah and of Naomi and Ruth, we can see that a whole book is given to the story of Ruth and Naomi, and Hannah's story is given in a very uplifting manner. And so there's no call that it must be a demeaning story. And by giving such detailed and graphic and gory events, he is highlighting the story in such a way as to make it unforgettable and undeniable in the imaginations and thoughts of any who read it. And the call for justice, not just a call for justice in this particular case, 
but a call for justice to women in every case in which they are mistreated. It's not said explicitly within the scriptures itself, but one must ask why such an amount of time is given to this one story. And so I will leave this passage with a statement which is protruded to trivial, and it is a call to say, never again. Thank you for watching, and I hope you've enjoyed this talk.